Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I'm joined by the amazing Cato AC. Cato, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I am doing very well. I am so happy to have you here. I know that today's been kind of a hectic day for you, so um, I'm glad that you could take the time out to come and hang out with me for a little bit. Um, for those of you that don't know Cato, a little bit about them. Um, originally from Albuquerque, Cato did relocate to Chicago in 2012, coming up here to the Midwest hang out with us a little bit Woo! um, <laughs> um <laughs> that was when uh cato came here to pursue their uh tenure and on-camera career um when when you were working in theater and working in film i always ask this um do you have a preference on which one and do you because i know that like with theater there's that immediate reaction and with film you have to wait a little bit to get the reactions to the film so is there like the big difference between those for you which one do you prefer to do you know, that's a really great question. Um, I think it, it, it's so funny because if you asked me this like 10 years ago, I would have vehemently said, I'm a stage actor only. That's all I'll ever do. Um, mm -hmm. And then in 2017, I was cast in my first feature and I was like, wait a minute, there's something to this on camera stuff. Um, they're comp I think they're completely different beasts. Uh, you know, like like you're saying, you get that immediate response from an audience. There's something really magical about the the immediate connection right there as you are experiencing something on stage and the audience is experiencing something along with you. But that being said, you know the magic of filmmaking is also incredible. Um, sure. So I don't I don't think to me they're apples and oranges, and I love them both. And I will sure. I will absolutely do both forever and ever until the end of time. <laughs> well, and I always liken it to being a musician. You know, when you're a musician, yeah. you go in the studio and you record, which is, you know, making your film. And then you go and you play shows, which is doing your theater. When you're playing your right. shows, you're getting your immediate reaction from the crowd. And when you're recording your record, you have to wait for that to come out. You have to wait for people to be able to absorb that. So mm -hmm. I love the fact that you could take them both for what they are and enjoy them for different reasons. I think that's absolutely amazing. Um, some of your theater credits include The Moors, uh, Stupid Fucking Bird. I don't know if I should say fucking or not, but I'm going yeah, to I mean, Stupid Fucking Bird. It's your bird. podcast. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, those are both at Fusion Theater Company. Um, yeah. Film credits include Revealer, um, which is so dope because that's a Shutter exclusive. And anybody that knows anything about this channel knows I am all Shutter all the time. So <laughs> it's really cool to have somebody else on here that has been in a Shutter original. I think that's really amazing. Um, Two in the Bush, A Love Story is another one. Christmas is canceled. And the upcoming Black Mold. And Black Mold is yeah. something I'm super excited about. Um, spoiler free, obviously. What can you tell yeah. us about the Black Mold? Uh, well, I can say that, uh, at least in my mind, I don't know if this is how they view it, but it is uh, one of this like trilogy of horror films that has been recently made by, by kind of the Venn diagram of the crew is almost a circle um, of the folks who worked on The Stylist and Revealer. So Black Mold is kind of the, you know, another one of the, what we're calling the film fam. Um, and it's the amazing production companies of The Line and Paper Street and all these mm -hmm. amazing Shatterglass, uh, these companies that we've gotten to work with. Um, I can say that it was uh, written and directed and is now in the process of being edited by John Pata, who was our uh, post-production supervisor on Revealer. Um, I can't say too much more about it. I, it. It definitely has, if you've seen Revealer, it's a different tone, uh, almost, uh, almost an entirely different tone from, uh, from what, you, what you found in Revealer. Um, I think in a lot of ways, it might be scarier. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> At least when I was working on it, there were moments of like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had I some think Revealer moments. And, and you brought up the stylist as well, Jill yeah. Six, Jill Gavargas and what an amazing, yeah. amazing person. And I'm so glad that you can compare these all with that. Um, yeah. And I'm very, very excited for Black Mold. That's one of the things that connected the two of us. So I'm yeah. very excited to see what's coming up with Black Mold as well. We should yeah. Be. Um, I'm also a huge fan of Jill Six. She's a homie and I, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm a big fan. Love her lots. <laughs> yeah, me too. She's she's super, she's one of the most down to earth ladies in the world. And I think that she's absolutely amazing. I can't agree more. Um, I want to talk a little bit about you more though, Cato, before yeah. we actually get started into why we're here. You do hold a BA in theater arts from, uh, and French. So you, are you fluent in French? Oui, je parle français. <laughs> Yes, that's so sick. Um, Wouldn't it be cool to do horror in French? I want to do that. That'd be fun. 
That would be so dope. So have yeah. you ever traveled there? I have. I spent a lot of time in Paris. Uh, and then I also took a trip that was to Bordeaux, Tours, Toulouse. Um, spent, I, I spent time in Paris, like I said. Uh, I also uh, did a, a study abroad immersion in uh, La Martinique, which is off the coast of Venezuela. So it's a, a department of France. Spent some time there, which is beautiful kind of like French Creole tropical culture um, that it is really fascinating, especially like kind of thinking about French history and, you know, all of the impacts of colonialism and things like that and, and what this island encapsulates in all of that. So I spent some time there and kind of gotten to know a lot of the, the culture there, which was neat. That is definitely a bucket list thing for me is to travel yeah. abroad. I think that it would be absolutely amazing. And the fact that it you is be worth a, it theater, but and in French, um, Correct. And you went to Drew University. Um, I sure did. And another thing is, um, you also studied at the London Dramatic Academy. Now, um, you have a lot of people that are just like, hey, I've watched movies, I can act. But you've actually gone through and you've done all the training and everything like that. Now, does that help you more with theater? Or do you think that that helps you with film as well? You know, it's really interesting because I think I don't, I don't want to make a, a sweeping generalization about everybody's experiences, but I, you know, I think that there are, there are folks that go into it and focus exclusively on, on camera. There are folks that go into it and they focus exclusively on stage and specifically like musical theater. Um, I kind of got the best of all worlds because I went into it and my passion really was lying in the classics. I really was very into Greek theater. Um, restoration era theater but also Shakespeare sure. is kind of my main my main focus um which uh shout out to my professor Chris Sarasso for really like laying it out there being like hey if you're going to be an actor be prepared this is what it looks like and it's truly what he described so um I would say that for me you know I went into it thinking that I was going to be focusing predominantly on doing theater work and having that be the kind of the the overarching theme of my my professional career with that was that it was going to be theatrical productions but i found that my theater training has absolutely informed my on camera training and and one of the things that i i have found most useful is in that training you really do learn how to listen and how to respond to people because you know when you're on stage in the moment you're not just listening for your cue line and waiting to talk but you are you have to absorb what's happening with the character and process everything. And it's like, it's processing and going at the same time. Um, whereas with film, you kind of like get this chunk of time to work with it and you can go back and do other takes if things don't go well, but it, it, what? it does require so much more listening, I think. Henry so. Was sucking on okay, a I'm sorry. My, my daughter no, that's okay. come in the room. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll talk in a minute. Um, go baby. So I'm really sorry about that, guys. No, that's okay. Um, yeah. So a big thing with this, too, is, you know, when you talk about how you have to learn, not just from, you know, your lines, you don't want everything to seem like it's super scripted. You have to go Correct. into this natural feel to you or else it's not going to feel real. And yeah. I love the fact that even though, like you talked about with theater and film, they're two completely different things, you can take what you've learned in one and really, really use it in the other. And I think that that's an amazing thing. And the way that you have your mind open to be able to do that, I think it's incredible because a lot of people go into this just like, oh, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to read some lines and I'm going to do the damn thing. It's not like that. Um, sure. Like I said, I've been very lucky to be, you know, do little guest spots and stuff like that. And um, trying to be real and trying to feel authentic to me is probably one of the hardest things, you know, learning lines is simple, but to try to feel like it's authentic, it's not scripted. That to me is where the real, you could separate, I, you know, Bad terminology, but you can separate the men from the boys when it comes to doing sure. it like that. So, um, now I, one last thing I want to talk about real quick: um, when they are not acting, you can find Cato performing burlesque as their alter ego, Helena Handbasket, and as a professional dungeon master for the tabletop role play game group Rough Magic, which rocking that shirt. Um, one Nation Under Strahd. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I want to say real quick is just like you are a jack of all trades and it seems like a master of all because I love everything that I've seen you do. And um, before we go on to your first horror movie, is there anything coming yeah. up in the future that you'd like to talk about that you're going to be working on? Uh, I, I actually just uh, signed a theater contract for the first time in four years because Global Panini ruined everything. Um, so I will be actually going back to Albuquerque and working with Fusion again. Uh, which is tremendously exciting. It feels like a homecoming. Um, 
and uh, Black Mold will be releasing, I believe it's early 2023, but don't quote me on that because I'm not the editor. <laughs> right. Uh, and we, the minute we say that's going to happen, it's then it's not. So, but one good thing that I can say correct. is no matter whether it's released in early 2023 or not, you can get that news right away if you follow Cato on all their social media links, which you can find down here in the description. So make sure you are giving those links a follow so you can stay up to date on everything that they have coming up. You don't have to wait for me to give you updates. You can get them right from the horse's mouth. So um, Cato, the thing is, if you talk about, you know, being in horror movies or doing theater, you know, acting in general, when you're talking about the horror aspect of it, you can't do that unless horror started for you somewhere. So let's go back to the past, Kato. What I want to do now is talk about the first horror movie that you watched. And boy, do I love talking about this film. Kato, your first horror movie was? The Sixth Sense, the M. Night Shyamalan movie. <laughs> um, I've always said this, and I don't mean this as a negative by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the Sixth Sense, the worst part about this movie is the ending. And I don't mean that because it's bad or anything like that. The ending is so damn good that right. it makes you forget how great the rest of this movie truly is because everybody gets stuck on that ending. But yep. um, do you remember about how old you were the first time you had seen this, Kato? Oh, man. Mm. I want to say I was like 11 or 12. Like I was too little to be watching this movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like, oh, it's not horror, it's suspense. Listen, The Sixth Sense is a total horror It is a horror movie. Through and through. Um, yeah. Do you remember who you were with the first time you've seen it? I'm pretty sure I was with my mom. And I think that I, I am a self-defined creepy kid. And I think that like, because I was like one of those kids who would wear Halloween costumes during the year uh, and, and very Dude much got kind of... long swimming, Leah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was, I was a self-defined creepy kid. So I think my mom was like picking up on that. Like she knew Halloween was my favorite holiday. So it was a little bit like, I don't know if it was like her testing the water. I mean, I was 11 or 12 at the time. So I'm sure that she has an entirely different story. But uh, I don't know if it was just like, oh, we're going to watch this and you can choose to watch it or not. Um, my parents were not super restrictive in terms of like, you can or cannot watch things. Um, but I, I know that she was in the room. I'm not, I think my older brother might've been in the room, but I'm not sure. I right. <laughs> I can say that your momster sounds amazing to me. So <laughs> she's um, the best. I, I was very lucky. I grew up in a video store. My parents owned a mom and pop video store. So I always had videos at my disposal at all times. That so. is so cool. Yeah. It's I like, it's one of those things where like, I never want to brag about anything. That's something I'll brag to the moon and back about. Like I got to grow up in a video store. Like I still remember like the smell of the video store. Like, yep. and I tell my kids, like, you'll never understand one, the disappointment of going to the store <laughs> and getting that video and seeing it wasn't there, yep. but you'll also never understand the pure ecstasy of asking them, Hey, is there by any chance this is in the drop box? And then you hand it to that person and they just are elated. Like it's amazing. I and love that. <laughs> I was talking on a, I was doing another podcast interview. We were uh, with paper street, uh, paper street productions that they were asking about Shakespeare. And we were talking about the 2001 Ethan Hawke Hamlet, where he does mm -hmm. that whole soliloquy where he's in the blockbuster. And, I, and what I had said was, you know, exactly what this scene smells like. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's a hundred percent fact. Like for me, the two things that I did the most as a kid was hang out at the video store with my mom and dad. And then every Friday we would go to Toys R Us. And I still have, you know, I remember that feeling of Toys R Us. Like I remember the yeah. feeling, I remember the sliding doors. I remember the board games at the front. Like I remember everything about it because I loved Same. it so oh, much. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Um, yeah, it's great. So and uh, the big takeaway from that is my mom's no longer with us and um, horror movies for me, when I think of horror movies, my mom and my grandma are the ones that started me with horror movies. And I just wow. think that that's something that's so special when you can have, you know, these memories. I don't remember my first comedy, my first action, my first drama, but I sure as hell remember that house 1986 was the first horror movie I watched. And I remember the Amityville horror was my mom's favorite horror movie. You know, that was her first horror movie. And like, these are things that I feel like as long as you get the education to go along with them, it's just like everything else. 
when you're a child watching these, as long as you have education to go along with it, I don't think watching movies create serial killers. It creates, uh, you know, curiosity. You need mm -hmm. to have the education to come along with it, to learn the difference between right and wrong. And I feel like the kids that get the education at that young age, they don't become serial killers or insane people. They're more grounded in reality because they know the difference between fantasy and reality. So um, yeah. with that being said, let's get, let's talk about some effective scenery here. Which scene from the sixth sense was it that affected you the most? Um, it has to be, it's earlier in the film um, when Bruce Willis's character comes home with his wife, I believe, and mm -hmm. finds one of his patients standing in his bathroom and he's either naked or he's in briefs or something and he's shivering and he's having a mental health episode. And I just remember distinctly like the look on the actor's face, like he was kind of hunched over and he was like, yeah, yeah. And trying to calm down. And obviously this is like the big like opening scene that ties all the way back to the end of the film um but that scene and that image of that actor is just like on a retinal stamp for me of seeing him and being that was the first time that I felt because I was I was also like many of us a very imaginative kid and mm -hmm. I could talk myself into the monsters under my bed all day you know like I could build a whole dark world for myself so to see something and feel feel fear for the first time watching something actually fearful or fear inducing happening on camera I was like oh this is a new sensation and I actually really didn't like it at first I was really right. I think be because of that and because of of all things the film Idle Hands <laughs> because of those two films <laughs> I, I didn't love Idle it. Hands I have not revisited it since I was like 13 when it just traumatized me and I didn't realize what campy horror was. I didn't realize that was a right. thing. Um, just, those two films need, like, listen, put me You off need to it. promise me, you need to promise me you'll rewatch Idle Hands and text me right afterwards. Cause like, <laughs> not only is it amazing, but it has like the most punk rock soundtrack of all time. Like it the really offspring does. is playing the prom, you know, like it's so great. I'm a huge Devin Sawa stan. Like we just got in this talk the other day about how I would absolutely love to see Devin Sawa play Freddy Krueger in a Nightmare on Elm Street remake. I think <gasps> that Devin, he's got that dark voice. He's ripped. Oh. Like, I think he could play an amazing Freddy Krueger. So if you want to talk I Devin Sawa, this. that's, that's, that's a whole conversation for another day. But I do want to blow just, your mind here for a second. I don't know if yes. you know. Do you know who the actor is that is standing in the bathroom? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, in my child brain? No. But if you're going to tell me, and it is going to blow my mind. So please. It's me. Donnie Wahlberg. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, they were really wow. worried about him because of, like, all the weight and shit that he lost to do that role. Like, he lost, yeah. like, a hundred and something pounds to really get in character. Because I guess yeah. Donnie Wahlberg's, like, a huge method actor. And, like, Oof. if you – every time I watch I never picked up on the fact that it was Donnie Wahlberg. I, you know, I watched the movie a thousand times. And a buddy of mine was like, man, Donnie Wahlberg's my favorite part of The Sixth Sense. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? What are you about? talking about? Like, oh. <laughs> he's like, the guy in the bathroom. And I was like, no. And I went back. I was like, oh, my God, that is Donnie Wahlberg. Like, and now that's all I see. So oh my remember God. that. Next time, check that out. It's amazing. Um, now I have to so rewatch both of them. Right. You got to text me after both. <laughs> um, so we talked about which scene affected you the most, Cato. But what yeah. scene would you say is your favorite scene from The Sixth Sense? Um, I think the other thing that is coming to mind is, I mean, and it's, it's absolutely iconic, but, um, the, just especially like, I'm so fascinated by child actors and where their lives go after, you know, mm -hmm. into adulthood. Um, and, uh, Haley Joel Osment, that like dawning realization when he expresses his gift of being in that iconic line of, I see dead people and how how scared he was and how I was like kind of not I, I was like close in age to him and I was like of course then I, I go back into my imagination land of like what if this happened to me what if I could see dead people what if like I'm seeing them right now you know I think it kind of um it I think for me that was the crux that opened the door to my favorite subgenre of horror which is I love haunted houses I love ghost stories ghost stories are absolutely mm -hmm. my favorite thing I also love possession stories. I think they're great. Um, but I think that this was kind of like the turning point for me of um, realizing how fascinated I was by ghost stories. Right. And 
another thing about this movie, like we talk about, obviously, we always talk about, you know, it's a ghost story, it's a ghost story, it's a ghost story. Um, this is also a very good, uh, you know, mom and son story. You know, there's mm-hmm. a very big family. Like one of my favorite, and I'll cry every time I watch it, when they're talking in the car and Haley Joel Osment, you know, he's explaining to his mom that he can see grandma, you know, and he's mm-hmm. like, you went to her grave and you asked her a question and she wanted me to tell you every day, what was the question? And then it cuts back to the mom. Do I make her proud? (laughs) And she starts bawling and it's just like the most emotional scene of all time. But I just, I love it so much. Like there's so much heart and soul when it comes to this movie. And um, it gets overshadowed by how great the ending is. And it bums me out. (laughs) You know, like... You know, I think that's a really good point that I didn't really put put together that, yeah, the, I think the rest of the film does get overshadowed because this was kind of the advent of M. Night Shyamalan doing these like these massive twists in more in more mainstream capacity. Like we've seen it throughout the horror genre, um, but to have it be something that a lot of people were watching and have it be such a right. pivot uh, was was truly kind of groundbreaking at the time so I I fully agree Mm -hmm. with you on that and I think it's because also I'm a huge Tony Collette fan so seeing her really nail that role you know like she's the best she is I know like the best whether it's hereditary fright night the sixth sense she plays the perfect mom in everything she does and I just want to hold her and tell her everything's going to be okay I'm here for her like did you see her in the staircase I didn't (laughs) oh my god you gotta watch it it's crazy (laughs) I'm writing it down. Right the staircase now. is a, is based on a true crime story about uh, this man whose wife suddenly dies, and there are all sorts of things that he says happened to her that she slipped down the stairs. There was an owl in the house that scared her. Like it's crazy, and she plays the woman, and they do these flashbacks, and she is just like perfect. I love her. Yes. I don't think there's anything now, she's then, ever done that I disliked. You know, like she's just. Oh my gosh, she's perfect. I love Tony Clay and everything she does. Um, now a question I've been asking recently. Um, the sixth sense came out over 20 years ago now, which is oh my god, crazy to think about. (laughs) Um, so I was like right now. (laughs) So the thing is, right now, all the rage in Hollywood is requels, remakes, sequels. Would you like to see a remake of the sixth sense done today? No. Honestly, no. I you like. I don't think it needs it. I don't think it needs it. Also, you know, there's this added, added factor of everything that's going on with Bruce Willis. And it's like, I think it's, it's a really, it's such an iconic role for him. And he is such a wonderful actor that I just think we need to leave it as it is. I agree with you. Um, I think that there's certain movies that should never be touched. I'll put the sixth sense in that group house, mainly because I'm going to be a selfish bitch about it. And then (laughs) Jaws is another one. I don't think you ever need to touch that. I don't need a remake. No, the only thing I could say positive, look, because I know a lot of people shit on remakes and you know, it is what it is. You can have your opinion and that's fine. But one sure. thing I will say, look at Halloween 2018. Well, it wasn't a remake. It was a requel. When Halloween 2018 came out, the sales on Halloween 1978 went up like 32%. And people that had never seen Halloween 1978 went back and revisited it. So mm-hmm. remakes can be useful in introducing people into things that they may have never seen before like you just had you know stranger things rock out master of puppets and kate bush is running up the hill and now people that had never heard these are going and they're listening to these things that they should have been listening to that are amazing and it sucks you got gatekeepers like i've been listening to this since the 80s shut up no one cares (laughs) let people enjoy things (laughs) right i don't give a shit how somebody if somebody found my podcast right now on episode 326 it was like wow i love this i would hate for someone to be like i've been watching since episode eight where have you been like that's such a dick thing to do let people yeah. enjoy what they enjoy it doesn't matter how they found it yeah. um so i do got to say Cato, that talking to you about your first horror movie is amazing because i love the sixth sense but i do got a little bit of a curveball here for you <gasps> my little it. buddy Ghostface here has a question for you what's your favorite scary movie Cato? what oh is your God, favorite <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your favorite horror movie of all time you know, I have been, we've been doing a whole bunch of interviews lately uh, with Revealer, which has been fantastic. We've been having some really wonderful conversations, including this one. 
And I have been asked almost every single time what my favorite horror film is. And it changes probably every day. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's so many subgenres, right? Like we cannot, right. how could you possibly maybe choose? Okay, so of Slashers, Scream is my favorite franchise for sure. Um, I am obviously a big Friday the 13th and Halloween stand um, and Nightmare on Elm, Elm Street. But for me, I the, the franchise Scream is great. Um, I really love Hellraiser. I love that whole franchise. Um, <clears throat> Also, the thing that came to mind recently was Ready or Not. I thought that was a great yeah. film. I don't know if it's my Very, favorite, but it just is sticking with me right now. And it came out at a time where horror was kind of on a downslide at the moment. Yeah. So I think it yeah. gets overlooked. Um, but Ready or Not is one of those movies that it, it's it's unfortunate it came out when it did. Um, right. Samara Weaving did an amazing job in it. Which she was just cast in Scream 6. So yep. whoo, that's going to be cool. Shout out to her. Um, that's awesome. And while uh, Scream may not be my favorite horror franchise, I think it's the best. And I've gone on record saying that numerous times. If the worst movie in your franchise is Scream 3, holy shit, you've done something amazing. Um, I will always <laughs> say my favorite horror franchise of all time is Child's Play. I think Ooh. that that's my favorite of all time. But Amazing. Um, I do got to say... And very little affected me the way that demons to some <laughs> angels to others affected me from hellraiser like oh yeah i love the fact that you go i went into hellraiser as a little boy thinking this was going to be like some crazy slasher film and it really isn't like there's yeah. really no slasher to this at all i mean later as the franchise goes you know pinhead becomes more of a slasher <laughs> figure but um i i agree i think hellraiser is absolutely phenomenal i think that it's one yeah. and i'm very excited to see them um going with a non-binary character in the new hellraiser that they have coming out because and what pisses me off again you have the gatekeepers that are like well doug bradley was pinhead but you know what if you read clive barker's book pinhead was asexual anyway like it was never a Wait, man what are you gonna what are you gonna do oh god right. yeah you know that like so if you want to get that yeah oh it's woke just like the new candy man movie was woke i'm like you obviously haven't seen the first one if you think the new how, one was woke how do you <laughs> how do you put those two oh my god that new candy man film was fucking phenomenal uh i, will I was say, a huge I, fan I, of that see i think it's a fucking like amazing movie the cinematography is great uh it's beautifully shot it's super i love candy man 2021 I yeah. do not love it as a horror movie. It didn't give me the mm. same fear. Like, you know, in the original, when you have uh, Tony Todd in the parking garage and you get the yeah. Helen, <laughs> like yes. that alone just rocked me to my core. And you didn't get that in the new one. So as a horror movie, I was kind of bummed. But as a film, it's it's amazing. Like, and I can't wait right. for Nia DaCosta to do her Marvel stuff. And I hope she comes back and does more horror work because yeah. I think she could be one of the best horror. I put her up there with Flanagan. I feel like she has the potential to be an amazing, amazing horror director. So yeah, um, absolutely. Kato, I do want to, again, say thank you for coming out and hanging out with me. Like, I cannot tell you how much this means to me. And guys, we are at the end of the third act. The credits are about to roll. But before they do, there are some links down here in the description that need some clicking. So make sure you're following Cato on social media so you can stay up to date on everything that they do. Now, Cato, before I let you go, there's one last question I have for everybody. And what we're going to do is go back to the sixth sense and we're okay. going to rank this on a skull count. Now, we're not ranking this movie on acting, production, score, nothing like that. What we're doing is strictly judging this movie on how much it affected you on first viewing. So zero skulls being not affected. Five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Kato, what would your ranking of the sixth sense be? I would say it's a 4.5 mm -hmm. because that film in juxtaposition with idle hands. Yeah, laugh at me all you want. You can at me at Twitter, but I won't respond. Uh, those two films got me to a point where I did not re revisit the horror genre pretty much at all until I was in my mid-20s. Um, and because I was so scared of horror that I just wrote it off as a genre that I would never participate in. And I dated a guy who was like, Hey, let's watch some horror movies. I was like, okay, fine. And then absolutely fell in love. And here I am with my own scream queen career path and things I never thought would happen. 
So and I so would say that it was, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that it, it was a very pivotal moment for me and it did actually have a big uh, tie in to my life. So, well, I mean, like I, I, anybody that laughs about idle hands, I mean, I know people, but me being one of them, when I was, when I was young, Ghostbusters scared the yeah. shit out of me. Very scary. Um, the Wizard of Oz traumatized yeah. me. Willy Did Wonka and the Return Chocolate Factory Oz? scared me. Oh, Return to Oz is awesome. Return and to Oz is wheelies, awesome. The wheelers. Was, yeah, the wheelers scared the shit out of me. They, they yeah. still scare my brother, who is five years my senior. Like, he's an adult with, like, a 401k, and it still scares him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, to me, horror is what you make it. Like, horror is the hardest genre to say, this is a horror movie. Like, what makes a horror movie? It has to be scary. Listen, one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen in my life is in Pee-wee's Big Adventure with Large Marge. Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that movie is so scary in so many ways. In the basement of the Alamo, like, come on, right? And when you have being those in the basement, they have the clowns, you know, and they're working on the bike. Like, I've always said this. Listen, I think that House is my favorite horror movie. I think my favorite movie of all time is probably Back to the Future. Um, oh. But I think the only perfect movie ever made is Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I cannot find one flaw in that movie. It's so fucking good. I love it so Please. much. Um, but yeah, like what makes a horror movie? Oh, it's got to have death. The Lion King has death, you know, yeah. like it, it's also it, based on Hamlet, <laughs> <laughs> right? It totally is based on Hamlet, but yes. like, who, like, I just don't get it. Like, horror is what you make it, like, horror to yeah. me, like I said, it's the hardest genre to lock down. So, um, again, Cato, thank you so much for coming out and hanging out with me for a little bit. Please, though, don't go anywhere. I have a couple more questions for you. Uh, everybody else, as always, keep talking horror, stay what you are. And we'll see you guys soon.